Friends, I want to begin this time of message with some words from our bishop, Bishop Dottie Frank Escobedo. She just sent this out to all the clergy and leaders of the United Methodist Church in this region, and so I share these words of hers with you. A scripture that always spoke deeply to me is the words of Jesus as he looks out over Jerusalem. As he came near and saw the city, he wept over it saying, if you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. We write songs about peace, understanding that true peace begins at home with us, with me. We hear the ancient cry of the prophets proclaiming peace is rooted in justice and mercy. And we hear the cry for peace from Jesus, calling us to finally understand what is needed for us to live in peace, to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Today, a song lyric and Jesus' weeping for peace are filling my soul. My soul is heavy because we know what does not make for peace. Bombs and guns do not make for peace. Human massacre does not make for peace. Walls and barriers do not make for peace. Hunger, lack of education, and inability to feed one's family do not make for peace. Throwing young protesters in prison does not make for peace. Sacrificing black and brown bodies on the streets of our country does not make for peace. Power mongering and political posturing do not make for peace. We know the things that don't work, and yet for some illogical and heartless reason, we continue to do them. What are the things that make for peace? Peace has to begin in each of our private and social lives. We bear our own responsibility for peace on earth. Sharing meals with neighbors and hearing their stories makes for peace. Laying down weapons of war and initiating actions for peacemaking, these will bring peace. Ending hunger, poverty, and hopelessness brings peace. Acknowledging power and privilege that keeps us blind to others' truth builds peace. Tearing down walls and having no wall celebration at the sites of former barriers will bring peace. Sharing power for the good of the whole brings peace. My, grief, my heart grieves over the horrific escalation of violence in southern Israel and throughout Gaza in the long-standing struggle over this beloved land of two peoples and three faiths. My soul grieves about the ongoing war in Ukraine and Russia, and my heart recognizes all the places where war is ongoing but never mentioned in the news. And also, my soul cries for the war that exists in our very own hearts, wars of disconnection, rage, hurt, and pain that bring about a desire for revenge. We are not godlike enough to get ourselves out of these situations. We need God's help today. But we can do these things that initiate peace in the world. We can boldly declare violence is wrong. We can call our leaders to do the work that makes for peace. We can love our neighbors both nearby and across the globe. We can pray and act and speak forth a new way of living in peace. She closes by saying, I'm praying for all the people grieving in Israel and all the people grieving in Palestine and I'm praying for us that we would be bold enough to live our very own lives in peace, maintaining justice, equity, and the chance to freely live the way Jesus prayed and cried for. God be near, God bring comfort, God teach us how to live in peace. Grace y paz, Bishop Dottie Escobedo Frank.
I'll have this copy on hand in the fellowship hall if you'd like to look at it and read it again. And also, Pastor Rob and I have it on our computers. If you want a copy to be sent to you, we can do that as well. It's powerful words from our bishop that I thought we should all hear today. Well, the story of Ruth and Naomi is a story about radical love. Why do I say that? I say that for two main reasons. Firstly, we're told that Ruth, the daughter-in-law, is from Moab. This place and its people are considered to be outsiders and not the chosen people as were the Jews from Israel. While Moabites are not listed as one of the people that Jews are forbidden to marry, intermarriage with a Moabite would have been frowned upon. This was because of fear that if a Jew married someone outside of their culture and faith tradition, that they would be tempted to worship the gods of that other people. Secondly, we're told in the first few verses that Naomi at one time had a husband. His name was Elimelech. I hope I said that correctly. And they had two sons. The two sons grew up in Moab because of famine that had been occurring in Israel. The two daughter-in-laws are from Moab, and their names are Ruth and Opa. Sadly, not only does Naomi's husband die, but later on, her two sons. Now, that would have been considered the worst case scenario for any woman, as it was not customary for a woman to not have a man to protect her and provide for her. These three women are suddenly found to have no men to do such for them. Now that the sons have died and Naomi has heard that there's a, there is food again in Israel, she and her daughter-in-law set out to return to Israel. But on the way, Naomi rightfully instructs the two daughter-in-laws to go back to their homeland in Moab as now they're not, no longer obligated to remain with Naomi. And certainly Naomi has no more sons to provide for them, she says. It helps to remember that at this time and place in history, it was the norm for a wife to remain with the family of her husband as long as her husband was alive. Or her husband had a brother who would then take care of the wife if that husband died. Well, back to the story. When Naomi tells the women to return, only Orpah listens and leaves her. We're told she does so very sadly, indicating to us that these three women must have been very close and loving toward one another. Ruth, however, insists on staying with Naomi and traveling back to Israel with her, despite not knowing what might be waiting for her there. This story, then, is an example of two women from two very different backgrounds and cultures choosing to stay together despite what logic and society would have dictated them to do. Well, what are we to make of this story? Is it just a nice story where we can all say, oh, how sweet these two women broke cultural and social rules. They are like the women that we spoke about last week, the midwives who disobeyed Pharaoh by saving the babies instead of killing them as he had instructed. So yes, they are another good example of courageous, strong women. I do like that. However, I do not think that this is all we're supposed to take away from this story, even as significant as that is. I believe we're meant to take a few more things away from it. Firstly, sometimes we must choose who our family is going to be. It might not make sense to someone else, but it makes sense to us, and that is what matters. If one puts their lives in the hands of God and asks God to direct their steps, to provide for them, to help them discern what God is asking them, then that is what will happen. You might recall the story I shared with you about my father when he came to the U.S. And although he had been given a welcome from his half-brother through a letter, 
that he would be welcome to stay with him and his wife until he got settled. Instead, my dad was told he couldn't stay with them even for one night. Thankfully, eventually, my dad went to a church that was nearby, and there he found an amazing pastor and congregation who became like family to my dad and later my mom and my siblings once they joined him. To this day, that pastor and his wife are still in touch with my mom. So some families aren't by blood, but by choice. Second thing we can learn from this story, we're not meant to hold on to prejudices that divide us from whomever we are considered to be the other. Instead, we're meant to love one another across racial, cultural, or religious lines. Pastor Rob and I have been helping to plan this year's interfaith Thanksgiving service, which will be happening here once again on the Tuesday of the week of Thanksgiving. Since we're hosting it, we're mostly in charge of putting it all together. We're doing so with the help of our interfaith clergy colleagues from around Santa Barbara. As we've been planning and discerning together what the theme should be and whom we want to speak and participate, it has become very clear to us just how important it is that we offer a space, space and special worship experience where our community can come together in a show of solidarity and commitment to peace. This year, we will have joint presentations by a rabbi and an imam. We will also have clergy representing as many faith traditions as possible and we are being mindful of gender and ages and languages represented as well. Thirdly, this story reminds us that we do not have to compete with others, but instead we can cooperate in order to achieve the greater good. Imagine, if you will, if Naomi hadn't been kind to her daughter-in-laws to begin with. They would have quickly gone back to their families of origin in Moab, but instead, Ruth loves Naomi so much that she insists on staying with her. And in turn, we're told later on in the story that Ruth marries a family member of Naomi's and eventually bears a son. Well, that family line is therefore preserved. And from this family will emerge none other than King David and much later Jesus. When we choose to cooperate instead of compete, great things can occur. During the upcoming Interfaith Thanksgiving service, we will also hear about how various faith traditions are working together on various important projects in this community. Those are three things that we can take away from this famous story. I want to ask you now, how does this story speak to you today? Is there someone that you're meant to include instead of exclude? Is there a person in your life that feels more like family than just a friend and you're so grateful for them? Is there a group of people that you have been told you are supposed to hate or at the very least be suspicious of, but your Christian faith tells you otherwise? This whole week, in the week prior, we've been hearing of the deadly escalation of war in the Ukraine and now Jerusalem and Israel. And like all of you, my heart has been grieving. It helps to know that God is grieving with us, that God is not blind to what is happening, that God still loves God's creation and all of God's children that even and especially in our fear and in our doubt, in our sorrow and in our concern, God is with us and God loves us. May God give us the courage to do the right thing, even if it's hard, even if it isn't popular, even if it doesn't make any logical sense to someone else. May we trust God to lead us to make the right decisions and to love others radically so that together God's love may be celebrated and shared with others. <laughs>